everybody. We're trying again. It's Lisa from Been There, Got Out. And I think we fixed the issue and we're getting Dr. Mark Singer, today's guest, on. Um, we figured it out. He is from New Jersey. He's a custody evaluator and he does uh, guardian ad litem work as well. He's one of the really good ones. And um, Hopefully he will manage to get on properly. He couldn't see the flashing button, but I'm praying that he can see the flashing bu button. I don't see him yet. I hope this works. We had a really interesting conversation the other day. He specializes um, in multicultural issues as well. So he's an interesting guy. And we just saw a message before that he's one of our clients' um, custody evaluators. So this should be really great for that person. All right, I still don't see him. I'm wondering what's wrong. Dr. Mark Singer, where are you? We just had a video call. We just figured it out. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, well, I have all my questions ready. I'm just wondering why we can't seem to get him on here. Let's see. Do I educate judges and lawyers on these hot topics? Chris and I have actually... Um, been hired and we've gone to Barbados and we have trained lawyers and we've also changed, uh, trained domestic violence advocates overseas. So, but we haven't started educating judges yet except, oh, here he is. Mark, I see you. Thank God, this is going to work. Okay. So one second, let me just wait. Where did he go? There he is. Just accept the invite. We're going to make this happen. I know it. Okay. I'm so relieved. Oh boy. <laughs> I was like, oh no, where is he? Where is he? Um, I was he just, did I, it. I apologize. You're like a total Instagram virgin. Oh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> you know, you know, you know when you're getting old, when you get out of bed in the morning, your back hurts and you need help getting on Instagram. So <laughs> that's okay, but we figured it out. We figured out video chatting. And now we figured out this Instagram live. So thank you everybody for being so patient. This is going to be really worth it. I know that we often talk about custody evaluators and they don't get it and it's so awful and horrible, but Dr. Mark Singer is different than your normal custody evaluator. He's really good. He actually was referred to us because we were told that he was one of the great ones. So Mark, you're based in New Jersey. You're a custody evaluator, but you have this other interesting stuff in your background. So why don't you introduce yourself properly and then we'll get started with these questions. As, as Lisa said, my name's Mark Singer. I'm a licensed psychologist in, in the beautiful state of New Jersey. Uh, this is my second career. I'm a retired police officer. Uh, and that's probably one of the things that got me interested in psychology and probably my psychology interests got me interested in law enforcement. Um, most of what I do right now are custody evaluations, risk assessments. I do a lot of uh, co-parenting therapy, a lot of therapy where there's been allegations of neglect, abuse, uh, parental alienation, a um, lot of couples that are sincerely trying to work together under, under very difficult circumstances. I guess the best way to sum up what I do is I tell people that I get to meet a lot of very, very nice people at a very difficult point in their time, uh, point in their lives, I should say. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I do. In terms of my academic background, my doctorate is from Rutgers University. My specialization is actually multicultural counseling, which is something I try to integrate both into my therapeutic work and my evaluative work. Um, and that's kind of me in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the, the interesting thing, like, first of all, it's wonderful to hear from somebody who does have a background, like obviously you're schooled in a lot of things regarding domestic violence, which I think many evaluators don't really have much uh, knowledge about. But can you talk a little bit about, because you told me this um, when we first met, your, your background with the um, multicultural studies and how that influences your practice. Like what are the issues you see? Because we see it with our own clients. But talk a little bit about that. Sure. You know, the United States is a fascinating place to practice psychology, and New Jersey is even more fascinating because we're, we're the most diverse state in the country. Um, really? when, when people get together, either just as friendships or romantic relationships and have children, you know, we tend to see a lot of people who 
bring in different cultural um, beliefs, cultural practices into their relationship, which directly affect their parenting. And, you know, it, it would be like taking me and dropping me in a foreign country and having to learn the culture, the practices, and sometimes the language uh, in that foreign country. When you have two people from different cultures coming together, very often one person's parenting strategies and techniques are foreign to the other person. And it, wh one of the things that I see, it becomes a very significant source of conflict in many cases where a parent may be using one parenting style that is totally different from the cultural practices, the values, the norms, religious practices, of the other parent. In reality, the way I look at it is that there's actually, actually a lot of beauty in that because to, <clears throat> to expose a child to various cultures, that's really what's reflective of our community, right? At least New Jersey and most states in the country. However, very often it takes some therapeutic efforts in terms of parent coaching, co-parenting therapy to help people understand that just because I do something different than you doesn't mean I'm doing it wrong. You know, many of us grow up in families where we learn to parent from our parents, but none of our parents were perfect. And I would venture to say none of us, well, maybe with the exception of the folks that are here today, none of us are really perfect as well. <laughs> um, but, to, but to be sensitive to the fact that in different cultures, there are practices that are different, doesn't make them any better or any worse, just makes them different. Now, there's some exceptions to that. You know, specifically, Lisa brought up the issue of domestic violence. In some cultures, frankly, in some states in the United States, the domestic violence laws are a lot different than they are in New Jersey. You know, I can speak to best to what's here in New Jersey because this is, this is where I practice. We have the strictest domestic violence laws in the country. However, there are people who come from other countries where significant corporal punishment is more acceptable than it is here. And frankly, there are many people who come from other countries where treating women in a very subservient, sometimes a very violent way um, is much more acceptable. Those kinds of practices, although they reflect a culture, certainly are things that could not and should not be tolerated in a, an interpersonal relationship here in, in the US. And certainly when it comes to raising children, there are certain cultural practices that we may not want to expose children to. And really educating parents on the potential impact of that um, becomes very important. Um, if, I, if I'm addressing your issue, Lisa, I wanna, I wanna make sure I, I am. The other thing yeah. I wanna throw in with the issue of domestic violence with culture, you know, one of the things that I think is very important in working with a therapist or an evaluator, there's a difference between domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Domestic violence is only determined by a court. You know, when people, I see, I read a lot of people's evaluations and treatment summaries, and believe me, I'm not a perfect evaluator either, but I, I very often see people get asked the question, in your relationship, is there domestic violence? And people say no. But then a couple sessions later, you hear that, oh, my husband doesn't let me have the checkbook. Or for me to get the car keys, I have to, I have to ask him nicely, and then I have to pay some favor back. Well, that may not be domestic violence under the law, but from our viewpoint with things like coercive control, intimate partner violence, some of it is cultural. Some of it is, is a very traditional sexist view. You know, men have certain roles, women have certain roles. Today, it's much more egalitarian in a good way. Uh, but these are all things that, that I think we all have to be sensitive to when we, when we engage in this kind of work. Yeah, that's excellent. Like, I, I'm so, just listening to you talk, and I know some people watching now, and certainly once we'll see it later, it's such a relief and so comforting to hear you use words like coercive control and intimate partner violence and knowing that there are evaluators out there who, who really do understand the dynamics of that. I actually thought when I asked you the question that we were going to talk about hair, that we were going to talk oh, about different, absolutely. you want to talk about that for a second. Of course, it's not as serious, but this is something that people get uh, very upset over. 
Absolutely. You know, it, it's, it's interesting because being sensitive to cultural traditions, Lisa mentions hair. Hair to, hair to a guy in his 50s who's bald means nothing. Hair to an African-American woman is a much different thing than to a Caucasian guy. Um, simple handshakes. A handshake from me to an Orthodox Jewish woman or a Muslim woman is a lot different than me shaking the hand of a friend of mine. Or frankly, me, beyond culture, me as a, as a white male shaking the hand of a woman who's been a domestic violence victim where I may not even be aware of it is a much more imposing thing than a, a different circumstance. So to be sensitive to that, sensitive to, to personal space. You know, one of the things I learned from being a police officer is that we, we would get calls frequently. Someone would call up saying there's three guys fighting on the street corner. And you get there and there'd be three or four Spanish speaking men who were discussing politics. It looked like they were fighting though, because the, the idea of personal space culturally is a, is a much different thing. Personal space between a psychologist and a, and a victim of violence is a much different experience. You know, a guy like me hovering over someone who might be a victim of violence is experienced a lot differently than if that person's not a victim of violence. So certainly there's a lot of culture, there's a lot of, lot of baggage for lack of a better term. You know, one of the things that comes up with culture a lot has to do with, you know, how you parent children. I've worked with families that believe that the best way to fight fevers is to put onions in, in the child's socks and put the socks on, on their feet. Now, I didn't grow up that way. And again, it may not be something, or it should not necessarily be something that a psychologist says, oh, that's pathological, because it may be, it may be the person doesn't know any better, as opposed mm -hmm. to pathological, and it may be just reflective of how they grew up and in their culture. Obviously, some things are pathological, you know, such as, you know, human sacrifices, that, that kind of stuff should not be tolerated. Yeah selling children into the sex trade, that kind of stuff clearly should not be tolerated. But little things with culture, little dress, you know, the way I dress is not the way the rest of the world dresses. Um, you know, if I, if I can comment about dress for a minute as well. Absolutely. You know, this is, this is kind of beyond culture, but you know, I know from talking to Lisa and Chris, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to have done so. I know a lot of folks who listen to, to Chris and Lisa have participated, may participate, hopefully will never participate in a, um, in a custody evaluation. But one of the things I, I ask people to think about when you go talk to an evaluator is think about the experience of the child. You know, when a four year old or an eight year old goes to the pediatrician office, very often the pediatrician's wearing a jacket and tie and has a white robe. You know, when you send your child to a, an evaluator or to a therapist, I would encourage you all, just like as a, as a therapist and psychologist, I'm thinking about how people, how people are dressed, how they present in terms of handshakes and all this kind of stuff. But if you're thinking about with your children, you should think about that as well. Do you want to send your child to someone who's going to look like a doctor or worse yet, look like a judge? And the child's going to associate that with, again, it's just first impressions, right? Going to associate that with the court system. And we, we, just want to, we just want to make sure, just like us as a professional have to be sensitive to these issues, I would encourage you as parents, because these are your children, most important things in your world, right? I would encourage you all as parents to take that into account too. And even when you talk to an evaluator or talk to a therapist, it's okay to talk about cultural issues. You know, I've worked with, with families that have gone to therapists whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, both sides are respected. But I've, I've worked with families that have gone to therapists where the therapist's values are totally inconsistent with the values of the client. And these, mm. things, become, these things become obstacles. I'm sorry to go off on a tangent. No, I, lo I love it. Because already, Mark, you know, this is going to be part one, and we might do part two and part three. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I know that you had said, so you are a custody evaluator, but one thing that came up in our first conversation off camera 
is that you believe that decisions are best made by parents, but then people like you have to get involved. So what, what do you think parents can do or why do you think it's best for parents to at least try to make decisions first before getting a judge involved or before getting the court involved? And you know that the audience that you're dealing with often doesn't have the choice because they've tried and it doesn't work. Yeah, no, and, and that's a good point. You know, I'm a firm believer. You, you know, all of us have biases. My bias is that the Yankees are going to win and the Mets are going to go down the two. But, but <laughs> the, other, the other bias that I have is that decisions for children, assuming parents are healthy, decisions for children are best made by parents. The reason for that is that parents always know their children better. I think it's very... Um, very narcissistic for an evaluator to meet a child three or four times and to think he or she knows better than the parents do. I don't get the luxury of living with the children. Um, you all do. I think the more decisions parents can make on their own, the less decisions a judge or a custody evaluator has to make. And if a judge has to make those decisions or a custody evaluator, what happens is that it robs the parent from raising their children. If a judge has to tell you your child's going to go to this after school program as opposed to that, or the child's not going to play baseball, the child's going to go to gymnastics or dance. The child's not going to see this doctor. The child's going to see that doctor. The child's not going to see you every weekend. The child's going to see someone else during the week and maybe we'll let a grandparent go on the weekend and we'll let you be supervisor, whatever it may be. The more you can keep someone out of the court system, the court systems, and I work with a lot of judges and let me tell you, I wouldn't want to be a judge. I wouldn't want to be making these decisions per se, but the judges will tell you too, courts are not meant to raise your children. You know, what parents have to remember, and I know, I know sometimes things get real bad. I know sometimes you're, you're a parent, you're doing the right thing, and you're dealing with, you know, someone who's severely narcissistic, and no matter what you do, it's, it's not good enough and all that. I, I get all that. But at the end of the day, the parents are going to have to live with whatever decisions are made for the children. It's much easier to explain to a child, listen, sweetheart, you're doing this because mommy and daddy decided, as opposed to, listen, sweetheart, you, you can't go over mommy's today, you can't go over daddy's today because the judge says you can't. And as children grow up, as they get older, 15, 16, 17, they start to understand. I, I've had kids send me Christmas cards years later saying, Dr. Singer, thank you so much for all your help. I'm glad you convinced my parents to settle the case. That was wow. evaluator in control because I realized that all the decisions mom and dad were making, they were being made by their lawyers, not made by mom or dad. And to me, there's only two people, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. I, I agree with that. But to me, at the end of the day, there's only two people that should be making those decisions. Or maybe one, if you're a single parent, it, sh it should be the parent. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so, but sometimes, of course, in these high conflict cases and custody battles that we see 100% of the time, um, mm -hmm. other people get involved and then we just have to figure out how to, like, how does somebody know if I have to get a custody evaluator, what should I look for in getting the best one possible since it's out of my hands and I've tried everything else? Like, yeah. what are the things that people should look for or what questions should they ask? Well, that, that's a great question. The, the first thing I would do, and this is probably going to sound terrible because it took me 20 minutes just to figure out this Instagram stuff. The first, <laughs> I, the first thing I would not do <clears throat> is I would not go to Google and start looking at reviews. And you'll see some good reviews, you see some bad reviews, but you'll see with reviews, people that have had negative experiences are more likely to post reviews. Mm -hmm. In a custody evaluation, at least one parent's gonna be unhappy. This works that way, it's unfortunate. Usually if both parents are unhappy, the custody evaluator usually got it right uh, because nobody, you know, nobody's perfect 100% of the time, so there's, with, with, with any evaluation, there's gonna be parental strengths and weaknesses. I, I think the first thing that should occur is if you have the resources to speak to an attorney, to talk to an attorney about his or her experiences with different evaluators. I, I, think, 
I think qualifications are important, obviously, and you could get you can get evaluators' resumes. I do think it's very fair for you to call an evaluator with a caution. The caution is this. I think it's it's good to ask about process. How do you do a custody evaluation? I think it's very it puts you in a very awkward spot if you start telling the custody evaluator about your family. Because I'll tell you what I do. If someone calls here and says, listen, Dr. Singer, we're thinking about hiring you. Okay, you know, what questions do you have about the process? If they tell me too much information, that can actually get me thrown off the case. Mm -hmm. I imagine like a mediator who's not supposed to know ahead of time. Absolutely, because it's just not fair to the children. First of all, my view is that this information is so important, shouldn't be discussed on the telephone, should be discussed face to face. Um, I would ask the evaluator about his or her experiences, how long you've been doing this, have you ever testified in court? I would ask the evaluator, what professional guidelines do they adhere to? You know, there's the APA, American Psychological Association, there's AFCC, uh, Association of Family Courts and Conciliation. What you don't want, I shouldn't tell you what you don't want. I don't have the right to tell you what you don't want. What I wouldn't want is an evaluator who just flies off of his or her seat of the pants. I would want someone that that has done the work, that has um, that that models his or her work after some professional guidelines. I would ask the evaluator if you have concerns about culture. I've had families call me and say, "Listen, you know, we're from Nigeria. What kind of experience do you have working with?" Nigerian Americans, or were Orthodox Jews? What kind of experience do you have um, working with Orthodox? And will your schedule fit our practices that we can't meet on Fridays and we mm -hmm. can't meet on Saturdays? You know, these are all things to be very sensitive to. Uh, and, it, you know, I'm going to date myself, but there was a commercial years ago, Cy Sims, an educated consumer is our best customer. I think that the more evaluators you talk to, the more information you get, the better decision you make for yourself. I think the bottom line is comfort. And when I say comfort, not just your comfort, but more importantly, the children's comfort. You know, when I meet kids, listen, kids don't ask for custody evaluations. Kids don't want to want in front of a judge. Most kids will tell me, you know, I want my mommy and daddy to be back together, you know? But when I meet with kids, I think about what this child is going to think 20 years from now when they need mental health services and they're going to say to themselves, you know, my experience with the psychologist was just during a custody evaluation and it was such a miserable experience, I'm never reaching out for professional help. That mm -hmm. is not the message that we as parents and we as psychologists want to send to children. So when I say your level of comfort with the evaluator, on top of that, you're and you being able to anticipate your child's level of comfort. Because again, children have no control over that. Those are some of the things that I would look for. You know what, I, it's, it's, um, it's a tough decision to make. Yeah, just, this is such excellent information. Okay, so then I know we also talked about common complaints that people have about evaluators. And like I said at the beginning, a lot of people say it feels like the custody evaluator doesn't know my child. They don't care, they haven't spent any time, like what am I gonna do? So what are some other things that you, from your perspective, see? Yeah, I, I think it's really important that the evaluator hear you. You know, the, the most common complaint I get, some New Jersey's a weird state. You know, we have court appointed evaluators, then each litigant can hire an evaluator, then you have guardian ed litems who voice in. We, we should have a lot of, it's a very litigious state, I guess. Um, one of the common complaints I hear is the evaluator did not hear what I said. Because sometimes when you read the reports, not everything you say is in the report. That's why evaluators keep notes and keep files and there's depositions and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I, I think that when you speak to an evaluator, number one, I think it's fair game. If it's something that is that important, write it down on a piece of paper so you don't forget. I've, I've met with people who said, well, I don't think he heard me, but I'm not so sure I told him. I, how can he hear you or she hear you if you didn't tell him, right? Um, in terms of with the children, at least you raise a good point because when we interview children, the parents are not in the room. 
So they don't know what their children are being asked, what they're not being asked. And the parents right. You never spend enough time with the children. You never, mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, when children wake up with nightmares at two o'clock in the morning, I know that a parent is telling me that, but I don't know how the child's experiencing that. And, and that becomes the, the parent's role in kind of talking about the best way he or she can, the experience of the child. Um, and, and the parent's right. You never spend enough time. These, these things are time limited evaluations, right? They can't go on forever. They're a snapshot in time. And you're right. You never spend enough time with them. That's why it's so important when you meet an evaluator, any important points that you want brought out, Listen, I take notes during when I interview people. I think it's only fair that other people should be able to take notes too. I'm no, certainly no better than anybody else. The other thing I will say that's extremely important, whether you represent yourself or you have an attorney, have your lawyer or yourself organize documents that only reflect the referral question. I have people who send me hundreds of pages of tax returns. Listen, I can't do my own tax returns Never mind reading somebody else's tax returns. Are tax returns relevant to parenting time of a three-year-old child? Well, maybe they are if the other parent is not spending um, is not spending money on a child and going out and buying new Ferraris. So maybe tax returns become important. But I think in order to get your point across, the, the more you can narrow down the documentation, the, be the better it will be. Because when you flood people with, you know, 5,000 pages of stuff, you know, there's, there's a cost to that. There's a, a practical cost to that. We, we say the same thing with our clients, exactly what you said, but in terms of lawyers. Like our goal with our clients is that they, they're really focused and organized because they tend, people tend to flood lawyers with all, like, oh, this happened, take the, and that's a lot of money and the lawyers can't handle it. It's overwhelming. It's not relevant to the case. And there's no reason for people are so emotional, just like dealing with you, or they're just like, let me just give them everything. But you don't have time and it's very expensive. Absolutely. And the same thing goes with pictures. So I like looking at family pictures, but you know what? In most family pictures, people smile. You know, does it tell you a lot? I have a lot of clients that want to send me videotapes and audio tapes. Sometimes you get into a legal issue. Not every state allows you to record someone without telling them that you're recording. So you should know your state laws clearly. But, you know, audio tapes and videotapes, some of them are very helpful. Some of them, you know, you run into the issue of understanding that there's something that happened before the recording and after the recording. And I've seen people go to court. I feel bad for folks. I've seen people go to court where the other side hires an expert to show that the audio tape has been doctored. I can't tell if an audio tape's been doctored or not. I think Lisa, Lisa's point is very well taken. Be judicious with the materials that you're going to provide, whether to your lawyer or to, to the evaluator. I will say this. Most evaluators that I know, and there are a lot of people who do the work that I do. Some of them do them better than I do. We're all just a little different, right? Any evaluator that needs information, more information, will ask for that information. Yeah, same. Just like with the lawyer, we're always like, have your stuff organized. And even before a judge, if a judge wants to see it, then say, I have my 27 emails here, but not... Here's 27 emails that you need to read right now. Right, right. I agree yeah. with you. Okay, so speaking of that, what are some other ways besides what I'll call targeted documentation that somebody can prepare in terms of an evaluation with you or another custody evaluator? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing in preparation is just to be honest. You know, just really, really be honest. Honesty is always the best policy. Listen, everybody has things that they're proud of. I shouldn't say everybody. I haven't met everybody in the world. But most people have things that they're proud of. And most people have things that they're not so proud of. And, it, and it's okay, you know, because we want children growing up seeing that. We want children. I have three kids. My kids are fully grown, grandkids, a whole bit. But we want children growing up being able to say, you know, my dad has some good points. And my dad has some bad points. And my mom has some good points. And my mom has some bad points. I think being able to acknowledge your strengths and weaknesses, the strengths and weaknesses of your, your significant other. I think, I think that's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, beyond that, just be, be real honest and, you know, understand that a custody evaluation is, there's two ways to go through a custody evaluation. 
the uncomfortable way and the less uncomfortable way. Most people that I meet that go through custody evaluations, I've never met anyone that has said, you know what, doctor, the day I got married was the happiest day in my life. And on that day, I said to my wife or to my husband, I hope someday we have to do a custody evaluation. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, think, I think anything that the evaluator can do to make it less uncomfortable is a good thing. The other thing I would say is in terms of preparation, I think it's very important that if there are questions that get asked of you, have you ever been the victim of domestic violence? I think it's important to reflect on the question because as we were talking before, there's a difference between domestic violence and intimate partner violence, coercive control that may or may not be domestic violence, you know? Domestic violence in New Jersey is a weird thing. It's like 14 different crimes. If I call you late at night, if you and I dated, I call you late at night, I hang up on you, that's domestic violence. But if I'm with you in a room and I'm yelling and screaming at you and disparaging you, may or may not be domestic violence. It's just a weird thing. And I think also being able to give specific examples of whatever you're talking about. You know, if you say, well, my, my partner was controlling, be able to give specific examples of that. If you say that my, you know, my wife, uh, my wife used to throw the best birthday parties for my children, being able to give an example of that. I think that's all, that's all very helpful. The more specific you can be, the better. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because with our clients, we say, let's focus on some themes that deal with custody factors and then figure out some examples that fit those themes specifically. Um, as you were talking, I thought of another question, which is, Often we get a client that will say, I know the evaluator doesn't like me. What would make you dislike a person? Me? You know what? You're, you're, that's, it's probably not a great question to ask me. I think they should be not giving away. In no, you know what? There's, there's, I can honestly say when I evaluate people, you know, to me, disliking someone is something personal. Uh, I, I don't. I can honestly say I don't dislike people that I evaluate. I think that's making a value judgment about a person. I think, I, but you raise a good point, Lisa. I think if 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 an evaluator gets to a point where he or she says to himself, "I don't like this person. This person disgusts me. They should not be doing the evaluation." You know, I, I we kind of open by talking about the idea that. You know, I get to see a lot of really, really nice people at a very difficult point in their lives. And I understand that it, that because of that, there's going to be an impact upon how they behave. There'd be an impact on any of us. Um, I think when you get into the issue of dislike, that's a bias that could interfere with, um, with, with the work that we do. Have there been therapy clients that I've turned away because of some of the behaviors? Listen, told you I'm a retired police officer. I had a call from a guy who shot and killed a police officer, wanted to come to therapy. Is it something I can handle? Probably. Is it something that would irk me? Probably. I just respectfully excuse myself. I think any professional who, who gets to that point where they can recognize his or her biases should act on that. And, you know, if someone came in here and I said to myself, I really don't like this person, I would refer them elsewhere. Because it, it's not so much for the person, it's for the most valuable thing in their world, which are the children. You don't want, to, you don't want an evaluator that's gonna mess with anybody's, any, anybody's child. Yeah, you know, and I'm thinking as you're saying this and just looking at a lot of, a couple of the comments, like another common scenario we get with clients is they'll say, this, the, the custody evaluator either doesn't like me or it's not going in my favor and I'm really scared and I feel like the evaluator is being convinced by the abusive party that I'm this terrible person and I think we need to get this evaluator off the case. But that doesn't usually work, right? Like if you're in the middle of an evaluation, you can't, people can't just say, well, I don't like what the person's saying because it doesn't favor me, so I want to get rid of them. Yeah. But I'm sure you see stuff like that often. You, you know, it, it, it happens periodically. I've only had like in, I've been practicing since 97. I've only had one or two times where people have, people, for example, refuse to pay. Mm -hmm. And then the judge can't order you to work for free, right? But maybe that's one or two times. Very rarely, just like, law, just like it's hard for lawyers to get off cases, 
very rarely will a judge throw someone off a case. Um, I, I will also say this. You know, and I tell people when I first meet them, sometimes it feels like an interrogation and I, I don't mean it to be. But there are sometimes people leave with the idea that I'm giving this evaluator a negative impression or I'm not winning. Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody thinks. Listen, nobody wins. You just want recommendations that are in the best interest of the children. There's nothing to win, nothing to lose. Um, but nobody wins. Um, it's hard if, if, if you, unless you feel that the evaluator is very biased, it would be hard to get an evaluator, at least here in New Jersey, to get an evaluator thrown off the case. And frankly, as I said before, if the evaluator feels biased, he or she should excuse himself from the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let me just check the time, so I know you have an appointment in just a few minutes, right? Fuck yeah. Right, so you know what? Maybe uh, this will be like a little um, tiny question. Actually, no, I'm gonna jump ahead because I already know I'm gonna have you back and we'll talk more about parental alienation and all that. But another thing that we talked about that I think you can answer in just a couple of minutes is, what are some misconceptions or mistakes that people make when they go to an evaluator? Like you said, sometimes people show up and... Right, well, you know, the, the, probably the biggest misconception is that there's some magic to this. I get, I get calls. Doctor, my, uh, my husband is very narcissistic and he's gonna to try to lie to you. Can you tell when he's lying? Listen, sometimes yes, sometimes no. That's why we look for collateral sources of information to verify, to confirm or disconfirm information. Um, but there's no magic thing here. You know, There's no magic test I can give someone that says, you're a great parent and you're better than that parent. Frankly, most of the people that I see are pretty decent parents, but it's like nitro and glycerin. If you keep them separate, fine. If you put them together, ba-boom. Some parents I see are not so good parents. Um, so there's a misconception that, that, you know, that we're always gonna get it right, that we're always able to see through veneers, see through defenses. Um, probably the biggest mistake people make is they come to the evaluation with a suitcase full of stuff. And they plop the stuff down and the evaluator usually starts talking about the process and all that kind of stuff, which I think is important. And I think, I know I'm jumping back for a minute. Lisa asked before Fine. about preparing, preparing for evalua evaluation. Any questions that you want answered, you have the right to ask. Don't be afraid to, even in the middle of an evaluation, don't be afraid to ask questions. But beyond that, people come in with a suitcase full of stuff and they start wanting to go through all of their items, it's, it's not very helpful. It slows down the process. There may be a time and a place for that, but again, being judicious with the information. Um, beyond that, you know, the other thing, I, I guess the other, not misconception, but the other, the other problematic behavior is not showing up when you're supposed to show up. You know, part of parenting is planning, organizing, directing. Uh, making an appointment for one o'clock and rolling in at one twenty, and say, well, I just got out of bed. Well, you know, that doesn't bode well. It's got nothing to do with your character, but it doesn't bode well in terms of timeliness and maintaining appointments. If you have trouble controlling your, your own appointments, is that parent gonna have difficulty managing three children? Who's got baseball? Who's got the orthodontist? Who's got doctors? Who's got CCD? You know, just as examples. Yeah, I know the other thing that, that, that we talked about was uh, parents thinking that it's going to be a therapy session. Yeah, and that's why it's really clear or should be clear in the statement of understanding that you all have to sign. This is not therapy. There's no confidentiality here. And usually the evaluator, at least in my experience, the evaluator the first day when you, you meet him or her will talk about that. And it's important that the kids know that too. I think it's terrible to take a 14-year-old and to say to a 14 year old, you can tell me and I'm not gonna tell your parents. Because at the end of this evaluation, I know the parents are gonna know. They may not know for me, but they're likely to know from the report. You know, so being really transparent and setting the limits uh, in terms of this is not a therapy session. It's not my role. And I put this right in my statement of understanding actually. It's not my role to provide psychological advice. It's my role to come up with what I think, knowing, knowing that you, parent, know better than I, what I think's in, my, in your children's best interest. 
I think it's really important to keep those boundaries clear. An evaluator should not giving you the advice that a parent coordinator should be giving you. They're not here to mediate between the parties. They're here for a very, very specific role. I, that's, I, I'm so glad you said that because that's a big thing. Like people will often say, and even the other parents say, we have to wait and see what the evaluator says we should do. And it's like, you're, you're clarifying that's not your role. Yeah, yeah and that, that's an interesting point too, because you know, at least here in New Jersey, if you're in the middle of a custody evaluation and you say, listen, I'm investing all this time, all this money, all this emotional energy, I'm shuffling the kids to appointments, all that. If you and the other parent think that you can resolve the issue on your own, all it takes is a letter from the lawyers or from yourselves saying, hey, listen, doctor, hold off 30 days. I think we can resolve the issue. Sometimes when parents are halfway or even less through this process, they realize that, hey, listen, it is in my child's best interest for me to make these decisions, not for this doctor. He's a nice guy, a nice girl, but, you know, they should, I shouldn't be raising your children. Um, so there's a, there's a way to kind of kind of get out of it as well. Yeah. All right. So I know you have another appointment, but Mark, how can people find you if they want to use you? I know they have to be in New Jersey, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm licensed in New Jersey. I have associates here that are licensed in New York and New Jersey. You can always Google me, uh, um, my name, Livingston, New Jersey. We have a website, West Essex Psychology Center. You get, get all my phone information. Um, if you, if my email is real simple. It's my name, D-R-M-A-R-K. S-I-N-G-E-R at gmail.com. And I certainly hope to be able to come back here uh, at another date and time. And I sincerely appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I, I guess the one thing I will say is that in my experience doing custody evaluations, 99% um, of the time, things work out fine for the children in the long run. Really? You know, they, they do, they do. The journey to get there could be a little bumpy but in the long run, I, listen, I've seen kids who were severely alienated, as an example. They go off to college. They come back totally different than when they left, you know. Uh, That's lot, comforting. <laughs> a lot of that speaks to the quality of the parent who has tolerated that. A lot of it speaks to the kids. But most of the time, things, things work out, which I guess is a good thing. Yeah, and that's going to be like a big thing that we talk about because we had all kinds of other questions about parental alienation, getting kids back and all of that. So that'll be for next time, Happy plus something that we didn't get to today. But thank you again so much, Mark, for coming. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the patience with, with Instagram. And I, I want to thank you all for listening as well. And I, I wish everybody the best. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.